We're here to discuss Palestinian-Israeli issues, even at a time when they seem to be overshadowed by other things happening in the region, uh, because they're so critical. Uh, in recent years, we're hearing more and more conversation about whether the window for a two-state solution is closing or has closed because of settlements and bypass roads and the wall and checkpoints and the separation of Gaza and the West Bank and the separation of Hamas and Fatah and maybe most importantly because of the entrenched power of the pro-settlement movement in Israel. And at the same time we're hearing conversations about uh, a one-state outcome if a two-state agreement is not going to be met. And what, an, what a one-state outcome would look like. Would it be apartheid? Would it be a binational state in which people had equal rights? How long would that take? Would that happen peacefully? Would that happen after a lot of blood? And in uh, the midst of these conversations, we have an American-sponsored negotiation taking place between Israel and Palestine. And we have speakers here who can talk about all these issues, uh, what the positions of the parties are, what the need for compromise is, what the prospects for compromise are, and what is the situation on the ground, how difficult it is for their organizations to provide or to assist in economic development, education, and health care. The ambassador is not with us yet, but he will be. Uh, I will just briefly introduce the speakers because there is more in your booklets about them, and I will wait to introduce the ambassador, I think. But we will um, start today with Leila Hillal, who is the director of the Middle East Task Force at the New America Foundation. And prior to that, she was a senior policy advisor to the Commissioner General of the UN uh, Relief and Works Agency for Palestinians and an advisor to the Palestinian negotiators before that. Uh, then we will go to uh, people who are today running organizations working in the region. William Corcoran, on my left, is the president and CEO of the American Near East Refugee Aid and NERA. Uh, a leading provider of economic assistance, health care, and education to the uh, Palestinians throughout the region. He will talk about Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip primarily. And Chris McGrath on my right. Um, Chris is the senior liaison officer and the acting head of the Washington Representative Office of the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees and works with the executive branch, the Congress, uh, the nonprofit world, the media. And before that, worked in various positions for Senator Harry Reid and um, in the campaigns for John Kerry and John Edwards. So I suppose you might be a Democrat, Chris? Uh, so uh, we are a little bit late, so we will start with Layla, please. Thank you. Um, thanks to the council for the invitation to present uh, today. Um, I, I will just mention um, an apology. I have to leave um, at 10.15 to, to make another appointment, but um, I think this is an important panel and one that uh, sh should be um, given lots of time. Um, the question of the Palestinian future I think is, is one that no one really has an answer to right now. Um, there is an, an initial or an official uh, effort underway right now by Secretary Kerry and uh, the Special Envoy Martin Indek to uh, revive uh, direct peace talks between Palestinians and Israelis and to try to reach some kind of agreement uh, within a, a nine-month window, which I think is around April. Um, this uh, peace uh, initiative also includes an economic track, uh, which is intended to invest, bring investment to the Palestinian territories and improve the conditions of, of the Palestinians on the ground and, 
And both of, of the political and economic uh, tracks are noble and important initiatives. And I think that we can say that it's possible that this time uh, the, the conditions mean that uh, you know, another round of talks could actually produce some, some success. I think the Israelis um, are increasingly facing a, a fear of isolationism. Um, and a growing movement, as, as we've, we know, as of the one-state solution, that could potentially bring them to a point of concession on, on major questions like the, the, where the borders is drawn. Um, the Israelis need a, a settled border right now when um, the borders are uh, facing turmoil at all other ends. Um, and of course, uh, right now, Hamas is very weakened, which means that there is an opportunity to maximize concessions from the PA. So we could say that, that there is a genuine Israeli uh, intention or a potential, f at least, for the Israelis to see an opportunity in, in making an agreement. On the Palestinian side, I think if the opposition is weakened, uh, the PA is emboldened to, to make uh, concessions themselves. The population is very tired, I think, um, and perhaps less willing to continue pushing on existential questions. I think that's a big maybe, but one, one uh, <laughs> way of, of anal um, analyzing the situation. And I think um, there is likely a fear amongst Palestinians of the future because the, Israeli, uh, the, our, the Israeli society in general is moving to the right, the settlement uh, movement is ascendant, um, there's talk of annexation, there's the prospect that if uh, an agreement is not reached on a two-state compromise that um, there will be a, an Israeli unilateral, so-called unilateral withdrawal from the West Bank, turning the West Bank into a series of enclaves uh, that are on lockdown like the Gaza Strip. And in that scenario, that is, would be a worse uh, condition than the one we have now. So there is reason to say that this time around we can be hopeful that perhaps this can produce some result. But if you look at the reasons why we can be hopeful, none of them are that there is agreement, there is, there, the parties are closer to uh, one another in terms of agreeing on the substance of what peace looks like. Uh, it's not that the parties or, or the people, the Israelis and Palestinians, have a higher level of appreciation and respect for each other. Um, there's certainly no prospect for reconciliation and there's a lot of uh, hostility um, and there's a lot of suffering on, on the Palestinian side right now. And I think that that means that even if we were to produce uh, some kind of agreement, there's, there's a really uh, big hurdle to uh, mount for implementation. And so I think, um, I think people know this, and I think that instead of waiting for politicians to deliver to them uh, essentially a, an unsatisfactory agreement that, that may or may not address all the concerns and may or may not actually deliver a viable, sustainable peace and a new reality on the ground, people are moving forward themselves. And I think in many ways right now, the street on both the Israeli side and the Palestinian side are, are ahead of the politicians right now. And I think that no one knows what what, uh, what can become instead of what we've been discussing for the past two decades, the parameters that were uh, flushed out in the Geneva II Accord, a second track initiative, which decided you know, how many refugees would be going back and where the border would land and where the swaps would take place and so forth. These parameters, which built on the Clinton parameters, are, are not ones that are um, animating the public imagination anymore. They're not the ones that are convincing people to, to make uh, concessions. They're not the ones that um, people are imagining will, will deliver them to a new reality. 
and they don't have faith in, in politicians right now. And so they are moving ahead and asking the question, what are the alternatives? And the Middle East uh, Policy Council uh, sponsored a, a debate that was uh, provoked by Ian Listuk and with a New York Times article saying, uh, the, calling the two states an illusion. Um, and this, you know, is, is, was an important debate uh, with, with Palestinians and, and uh, Israeli uh, perspectives being, being addressed. Um, next week, I believe, there will be a meeting in Brussels amongst European parliamentarians with Palestinians and Israelis talking about alternatives. Um, there are efforts, grassroots efforts on the ground between Palestinians and Israelis to talk about co coexistence, to talk about alternatives. And I think that these efforts um, are, are largely still marginal. They're not, uh, they, they still seem uh, just, uh, they're still largely debates. Um, and I, I think that, you know, we're locked in this uh, binary of one state versus two states, which is polarizing uh, what is essentially a, an attempt to think about alternatives given, given the facts on the ground and given the, the failures of, the, of, of, the, of talks around the assumed parameters. Um, so these efforts are marginal, and we, we don't have clarity. We don't have a consensus that reaches to the to the level of the decision makers on what what the alternative looks like. But we do know that the imaginations of people are being animated. There's a new consciousness that is being developed. Uh, new expectations are afoot, and I think particularly on the Palestinian side, the refugee issue um, sits more prominent in how people will, are looking at questions of justice. I don't think that that necessarily means that people are saying all the refugees, uh, Palestinian refugees in, in the diaspora will, will come back, but what that means is that people, people are, are, have a higher expectation of, of ensuring that their rights are recognized in, in a final peace settlement. And so I think that, um, I think we need to be wary of these changes I think politicians uh, need to, to understand that um, the process of making peace behind closed doors and trying to get to a formulaic uh, agreement between Palestinian and Israeli leaders um, is not enough right now because if the public is moving forward and thinking about alternatives, if their skepticism is, t is turned into resolve for a new and different future, um, you cannot take for formulas agreed behind closed doors and then sell them to the people and expect it to work. So I, I really hope that, um, that, you know, that we draw on the fact that, that, that the street is moving forward and draw on the lesson of the past two decades that peace, uh, in a, uh, an exclusive peace be, uh, between elites, between VIPs, is not, is not one that's going to uh, sell, the, you know, sell the agreement and win the day. Um, we need very much to involve a broader segment of, of stakeholders. We need to pay attention to these new debates that are, that are uh, taking place. We need not to think about one state, two state, and whether or not uh, we're talking about the demise of the Jewish state or the ascendancy of, and the, the prospect of Palestinian return, and think more about the interest of both sides um, and the realities on the ground and, and what uh, new kinds of models may be possible. Um, maybe it's just flushing out what the two-state solution looks like given current realities. Maybe it's, it's figuring out what a one-state, uh, how a one-state could work. But non, non, nonetheless, the point is that we need, we need initiatives that reach uh, the highest levels where people are thinking uh, in new ways about addressing uh, the interests and needs of, of both peoples. And so really that was the message that I wanted to, to deliver today. Um, uh, that, that 
you know, there could be some hope and in, in prospects for the current initiative, but ultimately, um, if it doesn't work, you know, we, we, if we have uh, efforts on the ground to, to try to think about alternatives, and, and we should give those, uh, those efforts and those initiatives um, more time and attention because they are, they are really um, important for, for moving the debate and the process forward. Thank you. Actually, Layla has to leave at 10.15, um, and um, so, yeah, I'm very glad we do have a question for you. There are 120 disputed borders in the world today, yet in no other case does this prevent sovereignty. Why is there not a Palestinian state? Why is there not? Why is there not a Palestinian state? noting disputed borders. India and China have large border disputes, but no one doubts they are sovereign. Well, I well, mean, <laughs> one could say that, that the Israeli borders are in dispute, but the Israeli state is recognized as a sovereign, a sovereign state. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't work on the Palestinian side because um, because they they're essentially um, they they don't have any defensible borders or or defined borders that define where they can move and what they what they how they where they can build um, and uh, how where they can go to school and how, the relationships that they can have their lives are essentially. Um, governed by a system of occupation, um, so so I think you know perhaps uh, the question of where we draw the border, maybe it's less it's less uh, relevant, or it's one could say you know borders are increasingly growing re relevant, and nation states are 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 evolving, um, but but the main fact is that, and the main problem remains that there has to be an end of occupation for, for purposes of, of Palestinians being able to live uh, dignified, normal, uh, healthy lives. And, if, I, and, if I got the question. And, and could I ask, if the, um, if, it, if the question of refugees is so prominent in the minds of people on the street, and yet Fatah is uh, possibly uh, ready to make compromises, how is the street going to react if, if the PA makes an agreement that does not take care of the Palestinian issue? Well, I think it would be interesting for Ambassador Erika to, to answer this question. Um, I think that you, know, you have to remember that the FETA executive committee, the central committee, said no to going back to peace talks given uh, ongoing settlement activity in the, t in the West Bank. Um, they, there was a lot of division about, about this idea. So I don't think, I think that you know, the negotiators, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, Saab Arakat, they they have a mission and they under they have a strategy and, and an, an intention to deliver a result to their people and that's a state, um, and I I think that they underestimate the extent to which the people want to see a resolution on the refugee question, um, and I don't think the people know what that resolution looks like exactly, but I I think the gap between some kind of uh, just a, agreement f on the refugee issue and the idea that we can simply put it aside, put the issue in a drawer, um, as long as we deliver a state uh, close to the 67 borders is, is a misconception. Um, but I don't think that people think about building peace in, between Palestinian and Israelis from the, the bottom up. So I just think that there's a lot of 
there's not, there isn't a lot of thinking about these issues. And implementation is far, the farthest thing from most people's mind. Well, we do have questions from the floor. And, and you are also an expert on Syria. So let me choose this one. How would progress toward an Israeli-Palestinian agreement affect conflicts in neighboring countries, such as Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria? And the overall US, how would it affect the overall US reputation in the region? You know, it used to be said that, that the question of Palestine was what impacted US credibility in all the countries whether that's Egypt or Syria or whatnot. And I think that that was the case for a very long time. But I, I think now US credibility is assessed on a wider uh, array of factors. And you know that may be good, that may be bad. I think ultimately, though, the question of Palestine remains at the center of any conflict in the Middle East, whether that's Syria, whether that's Lebanon, whether that's Egypt, because the fact is that US foreign policy towards the region is driven in large part by its relationship with Israel. And if you could achieve a real peace between Israelis and Palestinians that would change the US calculus and how it approaches the region, you you could have a different set of of dip, or you could have a different kind of diplomacy afoot um, that could potentially move away from a posture of confrontation and distrust towards one of of more mutual uh, relationship building between the U.S. and different states in the region, between Israel and the different countries of the region. And, and so I think a resolution is important. A uh, resolution on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is key for, for Syria, for all the countries. Um, it's, just, it's just a very hard, uh, hard project still, but one that we need to, to keep at the center of our activities and working on the Middle East as a whole. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to welcome Ambassador Ericot, and um, he's just agreed to, to speak last. So uh, I do want to introduce him, however, because I've introduced everyone else. He currently serves as the chief, rep chief representative of the PLO to the United States. Thank you, Leila. Uh, previously, he uh, served in the Negotiations Affairs Department of the PLO as Director General and later as Coordinator General. And uh, that department, Negotiation Affairs Department, provides support and assistance to the Palestinian leadership and Palestinian negotiating teams. So therefore, he has uh, the ability to speak on firsthand terms about, about negotiations, historical and present, I think. But, and we, it'll be good for you to wrap it up. Thank you. So now, uh, could I call Bill, please? Sorry, it's okay. Thanks, Tom. For those of you who know ANERA as a relief and development agency, uh, you will know that over the years we've rather been studious in avoiding the political arena. So we technically have no stance on the two-state solution. But I think because this is so prominent in many of our minds right now because of current political events, that I will try to offer some context based on what we're hearing on the ground through our 85 staff and five offices in Palestine. And what I'll try to do is give you some sense of that, that narrow niche of trying to understand through a series of anecdotes the receptivity to the peace process and the readiness to implement the economic initiative. And I'm also going to do this, though, in light of certain things that are occurring right now, or at least that I'm hearing, and that's rumors of extending the nine-month period a little bit longer. 
and how much longer that is is unknown, but it's a recurring rumor. Let me start then by conveying what we're hearing on the ground by looking at, at two, two situations. First of all, the people, and second of all, the institutions of Palestine. First of all, I think it's easy to characterize, as Layla did also, that the people are in a period of resignation, apathy, and disgust. And let me illustrate that by, for instance, just some individuals, first of all. You all know that post Oslo, there was an influx of the diaspora coming back to Palestine. They wanted to bring back their talent and their capital to invest it in the future. But now what I'm hearing is recent conversations that are reversing that whole inflow. For instance, two staff came to me a little while ago in Palestine saying to me that they just wanted to inform me that they're in an advanced process of emigration from Palestine to the United States. They're two exceptionally talented people who have good careers with Anera, and yet when I asked them what were their motivations, they were very forthright about saying, we have children now, and that's changed everything. And now that we have children, I'm not willing to submit my children for the rest of their lives to body searches, to checkpoints, and to the possibility of confisc confiscation of our home. And so what they're doing now is advancing. They're tired of waiting for promises and solutions. They're taking the drastic step of leaving their homeland. In a conversation with some of the business community in Ramallah not too long ago, I had a, a very serious discussion about the peace process and about the economic initiative, and it was immediately met by these very serious businessmen with skepticism. They talked about the possibility that this was all just going to be more smoke and mirrors, or it would be the very familiar double counting of numbers, which makes it look impressive, but in the end is not a massive infusion of money. And also they were not certain that there would be realistic blueprints for sustainable investment in the West Bank and Gaza. So they were skeptical. But then when the conversation also came around to who would be leading the initiative, Tony Blair, it literally produced spontaneous laughter because they don't treat this as a serious alternative. Now let me go to the general community and give you another illustration of the mood right now. And this is at Bearzate University. Recently, last month, there was a strike on campus, and it was a strike for relatively traditional reasons. It was a tuition hike, and the students responded. That's not the point. The point was the reason and the conduct of their actions thereafter was frightening to the general community. It became hostile, extremely polarized, and finally it became so violent that the campus was closed down for a number of days. And later in talking to a former president of Bears 8 University, he said, we have to take notice because this goes beyond the campus. This is almost like a canary in the mine. This is something that is not an isolated incident either because just in the past couple of days, Al-Quds University in Abu Dis was closed down. The circumstances were not totally similar, but again, in analyzing it, there's something underneath this, this growing frustration which is venting itself in a number of ways. There's something else that's coming out in society which should concern all of us, and I would say it's a new sectarianism. Now for decades, Palestine has been very proudly a cosmopolitan and all-embracing society. And yet we're hearing things about some people, and maybe as a spillover from Egypt, but some people talking about that woman wearing the hijab, and it's derisive. Or they're very derogatory about any public display of religiosity like uh, praying in the streets. And even recently in Bejala, which has long been a Christian, Christian stronghold, the, one of the local butchers there had his windows smashed and part of the store destroyed because he's selling pork and also wine. This doesn't bode well for a unified community, and we're even hearing it in terms of the way they speak of each other, West Bankers towards the Jerusalemites and Jerusalemites towards the people of Gaza. 
the traditional stereotypes and divides have gone beyond that now. There's something that's uh, a little more bitter and it does not portend well. And this doesn't even speak of the attitude in Gaza. Gaza, as you know, with the uh, Egyptian security issues, has closed down the tunnels and also they have seen Rafah crossing being closed down the vast majority of the time. The net result of this is now building supplies are not flowing through from Egypt. That's resulted in the cuttery projects, which you quite, I'm sure you heard about, four and a half million dollars of projects. Those have been suspended and rumor is they may never restart. In the meantime, 20,000 day laborers have been laid off. The price of rice since June has shot up 33%. Electricity now without fuel, sufficient fuel from Egypt, has now been reduced to 10 hours per day. With its own budgetary problems, at the same time, UNRWA has had to reduce some of its programs, and uh, most sadly was the school feeding program, which dealt with 233,000 children every single day. And in the midst of this, in its ultimate wisdom, Hamas has decided to impose new taxes on the people. And the new taxes are on some of the very things that give people enjoyment every day, and that's cigarettes, coffee, and benzene for their car. And so what you have is an increasing sense in Gaza of being physically trapped and also of having sacrificed for four years of, of economic growth after Operation Cast Lead and finding this whole growth and progress now suddenly destroyed. And as Dr. Iyad Saraj has said, this is now a society in clinical depression. And these depressed people in Gaza convey this to their family and friends in the West Bank. My takeaway then is the people are exhausted and they're weary, but at the same time they're distrustful of all authority trying to, trying to pick them up from this. And that's all authority, whether it be the PA or Hamas or even the U.S. government in some of its efforts. And so what we have is a society that is increasingly atomized. They're taking care of their family and their immediate neighborhood, but gone is more and more of that old, very proud community spirit that we sensed from Palestinians for decades. It's take care of yourself now because there are no guarantees and live for today because really there is no sense of future. And, and as a consequence, with all of this building up in society, things could blow up, yes. When and where, that's totally unpredictable. Some flashpoints are obviously Hebron and around Al-Aqsa Mosque. But what is certain is that the frustration is building. And in the intervening period, what I expect, sadly, is that we're going to be seeing more and more situations of violence which are rather random, like the bulldozer incident of a few days ago. And as a result, what we're going to be seeing is that people will just lose patience and go postal. In the end, what we have is a society that's worn out, it's impatient, and it's distrustful of anything that we propose. Now let's take a look at the institutions for a moment. The very institutions who may have to try to implement some economic initiative. And first of all, let me start with the PA. And I'm going to use just one ministry of the PA, the Ministry of Health, as an example of, of an operation that is not ready for prime time. The ministry in over an 18-month period had three ministers. All of them tried hard, but that repetition, that re revolving door has been very damaging. In the meantime, the staff have not been getting regular paychecks, and as a result, they have gone through work, work slowdowns. And they are, I would say, in a matter of sort of a bureaucratic paralysis. Complicating this further in the Ministry of Health is their lack of funding. And as a result, not too long ago, Anera was finishing a clinic under USAID money, a clinic that was extremely beautiful up in the Tubas region. Unfortunately, we had to leave it empty for some weeks because the Ministry of Health could not staff it with doctors and nurses because they were stretched so thin. And what this is doing, sadly, is driving away donors. 
because donors who may have interest in doing health care programs in Palestine are stepping back and having second thoughts and saying that this might be too high maintenance a ministry to deal with it, and so they're rethinking where they're going to place their money. Another situation is the Israeli cooperation through the Joint Water Commission. This is something that was, con that was created after the uh, Oslo Agreement. It's something which is necessary because the Israelis control 80% of the water, and yet the Commission has not met in months and doesn't have specific plans to do that. For a variety of reasons, the internal mechanisms don't exist that are capable of designing and implementing suitable projects or investments for the future. And maybe this is why the World Bank continues to come back to this theme. I don't know if you saw the October 3rd report of theirs saying that the West Bank and Palestine in general has lost $3.4 billion a year in its economy because no infusion of money will be successful without freedom without change in the structures, without significant and political change. Anera has discovered this itself. Anera years ago decided that in agribusiness we would move out of that entirely because we had all too often seen tomatoes, chrysanthemums, and thyme sit in trucks and wait for export, and it was not permitted, and so the agribusiness itself was destroyed. What we've done then is changed our whole agricultural project for simply providing for consumption within Palestine and assuming that we cannot export in a free manner. What the World Bank has surmised then, time after time, is that any business needs three things. It needs the ability for its labor pool to move about freely. It needs the ability to import raw materials freely and it needs the ability to export finished products freely. Palestine has none of that. And so more countries are questioning the utility of investing in Palestine under these conditions. You've probably heard that from the Swedish government and the Norwegian government, and I can tell you firsthand from my travels through the Gulf states uh, three times per year, soliciting money from them, that time after time they're asking the rhetorical question, how much longer to Palestine under these current conditions? They're tired. So in the midst of all this, Anera right now is asking questions. We're trying to do some planning. One, three, five years down the road. And what we've done is we've constructed in our heads three scenarios of how development might go. One of these is based on the collapse of the talks. If the talks collapse, if there is a cessation of negotiations and the two-state solution is declared formally dead, then the international community will surely drastically cut its aid and then development comes to an end. If talks succeed, though, if a viable state is created with control over its own borders, then we will see a rush of private investment and combined with the entrepreneurial skills of Palestinians, the economy will boom. But then we also have scenario three, a limbo situation. And excuse a, a medieval Catholic term, but uh, what it means is it's neither, neither heaven nor hell. It's neither alive nor dead. And what this would, could, would be is a, a, an extension of the status quo, that this would just drag on as it is. And yes, there might be some improvements in Area C, but otherwise there would be no comprehensive solution. And I can tell you in that scenario that business will not invest, the risks will remain too high, governments will reallocate scarce resources elsewhere, and from the donors that we speak to, individuals, they will feel as if the dream has died and they will stop. In that situation then, an extended status quo, it will not be endured for long. I hope these litany of weaknesses will only illustrate the need for urgency among all parties. Sadly, the nine-month period for negotiations may not be long enough to produce just comprehensive results. And there are rumors of extension. And yet nine months 
may be too long for weary Palestinians and for donors around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, Chris. Good morning. I'll be a little bit brief so we can have some time for the, the ambassador to speak. Um, I'd like to focus briefly on the specific challenges facing Palestine refugees. As you all know, the issue of what happens in the future to the estimated 5 million Palestine refugees with or without a formal peace agreement remains one of the most challenging issues to tackle for the international community. The UN Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, uh, is responsible for providing humanitarian and human development services to this population. We currently estimate there are roughly 1.2 million refugees in Gaza, 740,000 in the West Bank, 540,000 in Syria, 440,000 in Lebanon, and roughly 2 million in Jordan. There's also an undetermined number of refugees living elsewhere. And there's a continued insistence amongst this population that they have the right to return to their pre-1948 homes. And under international law, in circumstances of a protracted crisis, refugees do maintain their right to return home, and this also includes the children and grandchildren of those originally displaced. But in Israel, the right of return is considered a demographic and even existential threat that makes any discussions about this population extremely difficult. The decades-long wait for a just solution to the plight of these refugees continues today and needs to be addressed with increased urgency. Palestine refugees have had to endure two years of intense conflict in Syria, renewed violence in Gaza, added political instability in the region, and increasing levels of economic hardship. UNRWA continues to appeal in the strongest terms to make more determined efforts to resolve the Palestine refugee issue in the context of a negotiated peace. But too often, other interests have been allowed to trump the real substance of security and stability for Palestinians and Israelis alike. A faulty paradigm has been created that ignores the core issues and ultimately serves neither the Palestinian nor the Israeli people. While Palestine refugees wait for peace, it's incumbent upon the international community to continue to provide them with the tools and means to build their lives and secure for generations to come a future where their hopes and aspirations are not dreamt of but realized. Our agency's core work revolves around providing quality basic education to roughly half a million people running a network of 140 primary health clinics, extending microfinance loans to build financially independent refugees, providing much needed food and cash assistance to the most vulnerable, and improving living conditions in the camps. These are the building blocks that have, for more than 60 years, enabled thousands of refugees to graduate from poverty, end their reliance on aid, and attain full personal self-sufficiency. Today, however, Palestine refugees are facing new challenges as they're increasingly becoming an unwelcome presence in the region. Until 2011, Palestine refugees in Syria were afforded a wide range of rights. Property ownership had limits and travel abroad was regulated. But by and large, they felt relatively secure. Most were poor, most struggled, but they valued greatly the safety and stability that they enjoyed. This safety and stability has now disappeared, which only serves to highlight their continued vulnerability as a community. Since the beginning of the conflict in Syria, a reported 1,600 Palestinians have been killed, including eight members of our staff, and 18 of our staff have been detained or are missing. Palestinians in Syria have seen their camps overwhelmed by the conflict. They flee, but there are a few places to go. Some stay, some return to await their fate amidst raging conflict. In Yarmouk camp, once home to 160,000 Palestinians, probably 20,000 remain. The camp is heavily besieged and no aid, including bread or flour, has been allowed in for over 90 days. This past April, in Ain El Tel, a refugee camp near Aleppo, all 6,000 Palestine re refugees from the camp were forced out of their homes by armed opposition groups. More recently, the conflict flared up violently in Dara two weeks ago where seven Palestine refugees were killed and 15 others injured. In addition, one of our health clinics was completely destroyed and a community center was badly damaged. More than half of the population of Palestinians in Syria are now displaced either inside Syria or in neighboring countries. And the overwhelming majority are in dire need of humanitarian assistance. Though some Palestine refugees have been able to seek shelter in Lebanon, conditions there are abysmal. 
Lebanon is a country with a fraught history of difficult relationships between ethnic and religious communities. Palestine refugees are legally barred from most professions and therefore have little access to economic opportunity. Many in Lebanon languish in substandard living conditions that are compounded by the prohibition on the ability to improve those conditions. A Palestine refugee can actually be arrested in Lebanon for bringing a bag of cement into the camp to patch a hole in their roof. Turning to Jordan, a country that has seemed to be more stable than anywhere in the region, more than two million Palestine refugees enjoy a form of citizenship and have access to jobs and services. However, as refugees, they've always been more exposed than Jordanians to the inevitable hardships and tensions during times of instability. And now, during the current crisis, while Syrian refugees continue to flow into the country, Jordan has closed its borders to Palestinians who are trying to flee the violence. So it's clear that even in times of desperation for Palestine refugees, there are few options available to them. Earlier this year, President Abbas requested the UN's assistance to allow 150,000 Palestinian refugees from Syria into the West Bank. But according to press reports, Prime Minister Netanyahu responded to the UN Secretary General that he would only agree to this under one condition. All those who went to the West Bank would have to sign a statement ceding their right of return. Abbas refused. Many have tried to find safety in Egypt, but there too they're being turned away or detained. One of the most tragic consequences of their plight has been the re recent reports of drownings of Palestinians off the coast of Egypt and Malta. Aside from Palestinians in Syria, though, one of the starkest illustrations of the need for a solution to the Palestine refugee issue is Gaza. The occupation has and will always prevent economic prosperity, and the blockade by Israel since 2006 has turned the small territory into an open-air prison. The people who live in Gaza are largely unable to leave, imports are highly regulated and increasingly expensive, and exports essentially prohibited. Under these circumstances, Gaza is in a constantly deteriorating state of de-development and social crisis. Unemployment is over 30% and underemployment is much higher. As a largely urban area, the economy of Gaza is dependent on the trading of goods and services. So due to the almost complete ban on exports, the economy is therefore largely dependent on external aid, the tunnel economy, which has been severely curtailed, and remittances. Nearly all of the children of Gaza are suffering from PTSD. Family violence is rampant, and an entire generation of youth is stagnating. Last year, the UN issued a report called Gaza 2020, where we outlined Gaza's bleak future. By the year 2020, the population of Gaza will have grown by another half a million people, who will need access to basic human needs, food, shelter, education, and employment opportunities. Over half of them will be under 18. In 2020, nobody in the Gaza Strip will have access to fresh drinking water. The message is stark and dramatic. Unless the blockade is lifted and the economy restarts, Gaza will not be a livable place by any standard. The solution to this looming problem does not simply mean easing restrictions on importing building materials, and even this accommodation was recently reversed but resuming investment, farming, trade and free movement, and especially allowing exports to Gaza's traditional markets in Israel and the West Bank. Without drastic changes, Gaza will remain a man-made crisis, 80% aid dependent and economically strangled. A worrying prospect as it moves towards 2020 with a very large, frustrated, and unemployed young population. What happens to Pal Palestine refugees in the long run may be a political question but they're first and foremost people, ordinary men and women who rightly insist on achieving a bright, peaceful, and stable future for their children and grandchildren. The dramatic situation of Palestine refugees in Syria is the most acute crisis which they're currently facing. However, as we've seen, they're among the most fragile groups in all of the societies in which they live. And chief among the reasons for this vulnerability is the fact that their refugee status remains unresolved. Above all, and beyond Syria, we must therefore not lose sight of the urgent need for Palestine refugees at large to be given a political solution to their statelessness. The responsibility for achieving this solution rests primarily with the political actors and the international community. But without it, the Middle East will not find peace, and its people will be deprived of the security and dignity which they rightly deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chris. The podium is yours, Mr. Ambassador.
Thank you very much. First of all, please allow me to apologize about the delay. Uh, I didn't predict that traveling from McLean to Washington will take an hour and 35 minutes. That's exactly how much it took me. So it wasn't being lazy on my part. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, thank you for the National Council in U.S. Arab Relations. Listening to these two gentlemen, I missed my uh, colleague, Layla Hlal, who worked uh, with us at the Negotiation Support Unit when I was in Ramallah. I missed, I missed most of her speech, but uh, Bill and uh, you know, Anira and Onurwa, I have to acknowledge that are doing a very, very great job in trying to help the Palestinian people go through uh, this uh, difficult last because you come so optimistic and hopeful about the future, but when you listen uh, to speeches that uh, uh, summarize the situation on the ground, uh, you feel a little bit uh, disencouraged and frustrated. Uh, but it is our role as a political leadership to try to find the political solution because we have committed to a political solution in our conflict with, with Israel. I don't think the Israelis are still uh, decided on what they want. I personally believe that they are, uh, we are confused as Palestinians, but they are probably as confused as, as we are about what future they want for their own people. An important, uh, or something interesting I read yesterday, an Israeli writer in, in a local newspaper said that instead of Prime Minister Netanyahu insisting that the Palestinians recognize Israel as a Jewish state, he should tell us where he expects us to be in 15, 20 years. And because the, demog the demographic uh, uh, issue or, or uh, element in the conflict with Israel will remain, whether we Palestinians recognize Israel as a Jewish state, which is something will never happen before a final uh, settlement and before we discuss the right of return with them, which is a final status issue, or we don't. There is a big question about what Israel would look like in, in 15, uh, 20 years, and what Israel wants to be in 15 to 20 years. Today, Israel is aspiring to be part of the West, part of Europe, and forgetting the fact that they want to live in the Middle East. I asked this question to uh, an advisor, to Minister Livni, when they came here in July. I said, what do you really think in 15, 20 years or 50 years will happen in, in your neighborhood? Do you expect us to just disappear? The Lebanese, the Jordanians, the Egyptians, the Syrians, and the Arab countries beyond them, and the 1.5 billion Muslims in, in North Africa and in, in Asia, do you really expect us to just disappear and vanish and you want to coexist in a region while you are looking westward instead of looking eastward and try to make amends with, with your neighbors and the Arab countries surrounding you? And he just thought about it and he said, you know what, I never thought of that question. I said, you know, if you really want us to establish normal relations with you and the conflict, you need to start to think of yourself as being part of the region. Don't get stuck in the past. Every, all their political discourse and rhetoric, from Prime Minister Netanyahu at the United Nations to his speech at Bar Ilan too, they are talking about the past, about what happened 5,000 years ago, about finding pieces, ancient pieces in the land of Palestine that you know, signals that they have the right to rule the whole country. Well, Palestine was a passage for millions of, of ethnic groups and hundreds and thousands of nations. We are not denying that they have the right to be there, but they cannot claim monopoly over that piece of land and deny the right of others to be there. And this is exactly their mentality today. They are frozen in the past, any time they talk about the future, allowing the Palestinians to have a Palestinian, an independent Palestinian state, their only argument, it will be turned into an Iranian base for attacks against Israel. As if we are and the Iranians are in love and, you know, meeting all the time and, and forging alliances with the Iranians. You know, it, it just does not make any sense in, you know, using the past so that you don't move forward is going to be disastrous if they're gonna keep looking at their past experiences and fear the future and think of the future as being 
as being a threat to their existence rather than a period of cooperation, coexistence between two countries, two peoples who are living in dignity, freedom, peace, and security, nothing is going to move forward in that region. So I, I hope that the Israeli people will, will compel their leadership to start to think differently about the future. And I like what this writer wrote. They should think about where they will be in 20, 25 years from, from now. As for the current political uh, contacts, uh, unfortunately, we do have, we, we gave a commitment to the US administration not to talk in details about, about uh, uh, the, the meetings that are taking place between Israelis and Palestinians in, in, in uh, the region. Uh, the, the United States uh, takes part occasionally in, in those meetings, but uh, it is uh, uh, rather soon to say that these talks have failed. And I agree with you, Bill, that nine months uh, is, it seems to be a short period, but uh, if the Israelis uh, want to show good faith, uh, I think we can, we can wrap up things rather quickly because we have discussed all these issues in the past. There is no reason to start all over again. We, we talked about refugees, we talked about Jerusalem, we talked about uh, borders, security, settlements, uh, water. So the Israelis know our position, we know their position. What we need to do is sit down and try to take decisions. I think it is time to make decisions and not to uh, embark on an yet another round of, of, of negotiations. The, 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 the good thing about or the difference, uh, different aspects about these negotiations or contexts, that they are continuing despite Israeli provocations, which I think are aimed to push the Palestinians out of these uh, negotiations so that they can put the blame on us again, once again. And they are continuing despite certain acts that were, you know, took place against Israelis in the West Bank. So that commitment is important by in itself because in the past, at, you know, at, at, you know, whenever an incident took place, Palestinians or Israelis will stay out of the room because of the situation on the ground. The second important aspect that both sides agree, no interim or transitional agreements, that this has to be a, a final permanent agreement. We are not yet discussing all the issues, but at least there is an agreement by both sides that it has to be a final uh, agreement. And all issues are on the table, including the right of return, because the refugee problem was one of the issues that was uh, uh, agreed upon in Oslo 20 uh, years ago, uh, along with the other major uh, issue. And another encouraging sign is the personal commitment and devotion of the Secretary of State, uh, Kerry, who is backed by President Obama. I think the fact that with all the turmoil in the Middle East and all the problems that are taking place around the world, for the Secretary of State to continue to be committed is very encouraging and is, is, is something different from what we saw in the past. I know there are many skeptics here among, amongst ourselves and our leadership who are not very uh, uh, optimistic about the conclusion or the outcomes of these of this negotiations. But, uh, and, and the big question also, are the parties prepared to make the necessary and needed steps to conclude uh, this conflict? I cannot speak on behalf of the Israelis, but on behalf of the Palestinians, we are ready. We have indicated many times before that we are in this uh, process in order to find an end to the conflict, an end to all claims. This is not a tactical move on our part. It is a strategic, the two-state solution is a strategic option for the Palestinian people and the Palestinian leadership, although I agree with my colleagues who spoke earlier that the chance of two-state solution is slipping away, but I don't see an alternative to the two-state solution myself, because the, the other two alternatives, you talked about the three scenarios economically, I have the three scenarios politically. One is to maintain the status quo, which what we are seeing in the West Bank today, of course Gaza is a special case, is a big jail uh, surrounded by Israelis and people are suffering. Uh, but in the West Bank you have three different regimes in the West Bank. You have the settlers regime who are living in their own settlements, controlling their own roads, protected by the 
uh, Israeli army. And then you have the 60% of the West Bank, which is under total Israeli and uh, uh, control, both civilian and security. And Palestinians have no access to 60% of the West Bank, including 28% in the Jordan Valley, which is the breadbasket of the West Bank. And then you have the areas that under, are under uh, you know, either total or partial Palestinian control, which constitute about 40% uh, of, of, of the land. So we have uh, three different regimes in, in, in the West Bank. And uh, uh, the continuation of the status quo means only one thing. I know Israelis don't like it. I know, I know American Jews don't like it. But it will eventually lead to apartheid in, 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 in that part of the world. And there will be discrimination against the Palestinians. And Israel will continue to slide into further isolation internationally. And this status quo is not going to be sustainable. The Palestinian leadership will not accept that this, is, uh, this becomes the outcome after nine months of, of negotiations. We refrained from going to the United Nations or further seek membership at various UN agencies to give peace a chance. But this is not going to be a repeat of the last 20 years of wasting time getting into a process that will not yield any results. And after the nine months period, we will assess our situation and we will keep the door open for us to, to seek membership at UN agencies in order to force and pressure the Israelis to comply with international law and end their occupation of the Palestinian uh, territories. The other, the other option is, of course, what many are advocating is the one binational state. And this is what I alluded to when I talked about the demographics of the conflict, the fact that the birth rate among Palestinians and Arabs in the land between the, Medi the, the Mediterranean Sea and, and the uh, River Jordan is is, is higher than that of, of uh, the Jewish birth rate. Some projections uh, say that in the next 20, 25 years, the number of non-Jews from River Jordan to the Mediterranean will exceed that of Jews. So again, the binational state, although seems to be preferred by many, uh, among Palestinians and Israelis for different reasons, the Israelis want a binational state where a majority, a Jewish majority, can control uh, an Arab minority, and the demographics uh, point to uh, a different uh, outcome in 20, 25 years. The Palestinians think that you know we will then obtain equal rights, and we will be uh, you know we will be we will be uh, able uh, to use these rights, forgetting the fact that our brethren in Israel today who constitute 1.6 million of the population are still fighting for their, their own rights. So the political struggle will turn into a social struggle. And the third option is to do the two-state solution, which we continue to believe, despite all the difficulties on the ground, that it is the most ideal for both peoples to build their national identity and coexist together. Thank you very much. Well, we started late, so we have uh, a limited amount of time for questions. I'm, I'm going to try to combine them. And, and since we're in Washington, D.C., it's no surprise that there are some questions here about exactly what the United States should do. Uh, should it uh, put a map on the table? When should it put a map on the table? What kinds of security guarantees should we offer, particularly to the Israelis? Uh, and uh, how much money would be necessary to resolve uh, questions of compensation and uh, resettlement, uh, compensation for refugees, Palestinian refugees, and resettlement of Israeli settlers. Um, what exactly should the United States do now? Is that for me? It's for everyone, but particularly for you. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I think the, the United States right now is ally, allowing the two parties to, uh, to engage uh, bilaterally and uh, to try to uh, identify the gaps that, uh, that exist. I, I personally think that they already know what the gaps are, but uh, 
they are giving them a chance to once again uh, try to resume the political process after um, a long period uh, of this not happening. So I am not sure if, if the U.S. will end up presenting something uh, on the table because uh, uh, although I am someone who believes that unless the international community, the United Nations, uh, uh, United States, and the international community somehow put pressure on the parties, especially Israel, to end this conflict uh, once and for all, nothing will happen. But uh, there is a risk of submitting something, putting it on the table before you know that the two parties are uh, satisfied uh, with that. Because if one party rejects it, then uh, I think the whole role of the United States as a mediator uh, will, be, will be completely undermined. On the, on the issue of security, uh, I, I, like, I like the idea that we have to give Israel security guarantees. You know, I mean, uh, Israel is the strongest power in the region. You know, what about the Palestinians getting some security guarantees that the Israelis will not continue to violate their territorial integrity and, and uh, you know, uh, the, their human rights and things like that. So I, I, we have been very forthcoming when we said that we want a, a non-militarized uh, state, that uh, we will accept the role of third parties, but no single Israeli soldier will be on the soil of a future Palestinian state. Thank you. Um, the other questions uh, concern demographics. Um, Bill, you talked about people being so frustrated that they want to leave, and yet the birth rate is, is, is going to continue producing Palestinians. So when, when will the uh, situation uh, inside Israel and inside the West Bank produce a majority of Palestinians that uh, Israel may not be able to control or can only control can only control through uh, more violence and, and, and more oppression. Let me make a, a brief comment, and I think probably the ambassador is better qualified for that, that response. Uh, what we're seeing is that in, in certain communities now, as there is a, a bit of a, a brain drain, um, that the rural areas in particular are, th the family size remains the same. What we're finding, though, is less skills in some of those areas. And so if, if the, uh, the brain drain uh, accelerates, then we find the, uh, the ability of the Palestinian population to develop an economy that's stimulating and, and to drive itself on its, um, its own economy, whether it be in engineering, science, IT, uh, that's going to lessen over the years. And so. Uh, the sheer numbers, it may not be quite as important in some ways as the ability to drive its own economy with, with skilled talent. I have a question. Uh, and the, um, if, if the talks don't produce an agreement and we end up with a one-state outcome, uh, there are people who hope that it will be intolerable, the international community will find it intolerable for Israel to continue ruling over this Palestinian population um, and that the BDS movement and, and, and going to the ICC will, will make a big difference and that eventually, eventually, Palestinians will obtain equal rights. Uh, I wonder, this might be a cynical question, but if, if, the, if the international community has tolerated the situation that the Palestinians have lived under for so long, uh, why would they stop tolerating it? And, and if they're not going to stop tolerating it, how much violence is there going to be in the Holy Land? Well, I, I think this is a very good question because uh, one important reason the Israelis are behaving the same way they are behaving is because they know that they, 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 there are no consequences for, for their actions. They, uh, uh, they are seeing the United States providing uh, uh, political cover for them, of course, military and economic support. Uh, they played uh, an instrumental role in uh, 
undermining uh, and, and foiling the Palestinian bid at the United Nations to join, uh, the, you know, through the UN Security Council to become a permanent member of the United Nations. And today, you know, ironically, they are pressuring the European Union to try to delay the implementation of uh, a series of measures that the EU took, few, uh, you know, a few months ago and is expected to be uh, implemented uh, on January 1st. Uh, to uh, refrain from investing or, or doing business with companies that are in the West Bank and in Israeli settlements. So uh, this policy of give them carrots, give them carrots until they eat a lot of carrots and not, uh, not trying to, to wield the, you know, the stick, uh, which does not have to be cutting off economic or military aid, is encouraging the Israelis to continue uh, doing what they're doing. That's why... Uh, there has to be a change. I, I hope that these negotiations will succeed. I'm cautiously optimistic because of the, uh, the, the, some of the reasons that I mentioned earlier. I know many in this room and on this panel uh, do not agree with me, but I hope that it, it will succeed. But if it fails, you know, we do have other alternatives. Uh, the only way to try to change things is to change the political dynamics and the political paradigm. I mean, we cannot continue to keep all the cards in the hand of one superpower trying to broker peace between the two sides and yet failing to hold the one side which is violating international law, defying the United States accountable to their actions. We cannot continue to do that for another 20 years. And our people, like Bill explained, are not going to wait. Things could happen even faster than the nine months. Nobody can predict what will happen tomorrow in that region. So we will definitely uh, try to change this uh, political impasse if the negotiations fail. Bill wants to, uh, one more. Yeah, just, just a, a, a quick addition to that. There is a, uh, a strain of thought uh, in Palestinian society that's advocating NGOs to, to seriously consider withdrawal withdrawal from Palestine because uh, in some ways they may have, despite good intentions, been uh, uh, propping up the, the, uh, the system for too long and that perhaps if, if these NGOs pulled out, they would then be forcing the issue of Israeli responsibility. Uh, one of the greatest advocates of, the, of this is uh, an organization called Shabaka. Uh, this is not something we subscribe to, but I, I think what's indicative of is that um, there's more and more thoughts about this and thinking way outside the box to the current conditions. Well, I'm sorry that we started 30 minutes late because we, we really haven't had enough time for all the questions. I, I uh, hope the panelists will stay and take some personal questions in the atrium. And, uh, but the conference organizers are asking us to wrap it up, uh, particularly because they have other events before lunch. So. <laughs> yeah, we're being invited. So thank you very much to the panel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.